Hey everyone, this is Will and welcome to this brand new and exciting episode of The Missing Piece. When we understand the word globalization, and very often we tend to think about the ongoing political and also this economic shift across the continent. Take a good look around the world. The tension between China and the US. This battle between Ukraine and Russia. And of course, in the countries in Europe, most countries today are undergoing this tremendous, a tremendous economic shift. But meanwhile, it's interestingly enough that how some people believe that beyond politics, that there are more elements that actually can bring people together. It's not just about some of the social matters, but one of the critical elements in our life which is food. Have you ever thought about that? That food actually bring identities and even people together despite these political differences across the world. So that's why today in this episode that we are very honored to have Professor Fabio Parascotti. Now, Professor Fabio is a professor of food studies in the Nutrition and Food Studies Department in New York City. Of course, if you follow his work, originally he came out with this very interesting and unique book. It's called Gastronativism, Food, Identity and Politics. And we are going to talk to Professor today on why it's important for us to understand the significance of food among the international community and how food can contribute meaning to identities and politics. Now, without further ado, Professor Fabio, and welcome to The Missing Piece. Thank you, Will. Thank you for inviting me. No problem, Professor. The pleasure is all mine. You know, again, as we mentioned before, I have to say that you, your book, it's called Gastronativism, again, Food, Identity and Politics. The first question is very simple. Can you help us to understand what is the meaning behind the title and what inspire you to write this book despite what's happening within this international community, politically speaking, across the continent? So the, the topic, the main topic is an examination of how food can be used as an ideological tool to create communities on the positive side, but also creating others. This is us, this is them. And since food is very somehow emotional, it's something that it connects directly with our bodies, our experiences. You know, it's something that we ingest that it becomes us. Mm. So it, it's also easy for politicians to leverage and sometimes exploit this um, simplicity of food, the fact that it doesn't need much reflection, it communicates immediately. And so it's very good uh, for all sorts of political uh, goals. Mm. What pushed me to write this book is sort of looking at how around the world uh, two elements are playing that are relevant in this uh, in, 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 in this point, from this point of view. On the one hand, we have a specific form of uh, globalization. Mm. Globalization in some forms has been around forever. But from the mid 80s, we have a specific form of globalization that is connected with the politics of Reagan and Thatcher, mm. with the Washington consensus, uh, with structural readjustment, the World Bank, and then later on, all these principles sort of get enshrined in the treaties of the World Trade Organization. So a very specific kind of globalization in the book, I call it neoliberal globalization, mm. building on uh, many political scientists that refer to it uh, like that. On the other hand, so this sort, of, this sort of globalization is very much based on free trade, uh, global agreements, um, the disappearing of barriers 
uh, the state needs to limit its intervention. Uh, the private market will decide what best what's best for everybody. Mm. But in the past few years, we've seen the that many countries are moving towards uh, a more nationalistic, sometimes very conservative kind of politics that puts you know the country first in a way. But not only that, also within the country, tries to figure out who is the real citizen and who is not really part of the real community, mm. however the real community is defined. And we saw that in the U.S. with Trump. We see that in Brazil with uh, Bolsonaro. Mm. We see that in India with Modi, uh, Duterte in the Philippines. Uh, Kaczynski in Poland, Orban in Hungary, and then in other countries, these forces are trying to get to to control the government. That's the case of Italy, France, uh, Denmark for a while. So these were the two sort of situations that led me to reflect on how does food play on the one hand within neoliberal globalization and on the other hand of the um, emergence of such sort of populist, conservative, nationalistic, at, at mm. times xenophobic mm. uh, um, movements. You know, Professor, I have to be honest, is when we talk about international politics, I think on one hand, most people today are getting to the point that they are sick and tired of listening to the politicians because we always say most of the politicians today only do do the talk the talk but refuse to walk the walk but on the other hand as an international journalist i have to admit that every single country that you just mentioned, for example, in Brazil, in the Philippines, in China, and the US, I believe that everywhere I go, it doesn't matter what political background or what kind of political ideologies that we are entitled to, we belong to, but food is one of the essential ingredients that get people to become from enemies to friends. At least it works from my side. I know that you are such a scholar in popular uh, uh, culture and also in politics as well. So I want to ask you a next a very simple question. Again, this is something that you mentioned in the book as well. What does that mean that when we use food today that actually contribute to identities because normally when we think about identity i guess there could be a couple categories for example our career uh, uh defines who we are and the roles within the family give us who we are today and also about the social circles but less likely that we think about the word food how does food or how does nutrition that we intake on the daily basis that provide identity for us. I think this is why when I read part of your book, that really drew me close to your book and close to the content. So, Professor, if you don't mind, help us understand what are you trying to say and why did you decide to put the word identity in the book? Because I think really food helps us shape who we are and also what we think of ourselves, mm. how we see ourselves in the world. Um, mm. Our habits, customs, preferences are partly based on our personal history. Mm. Uh, I don't know, as a child, something happened, make me like this, but also make me unlike that. That's very common. But all this happened within a food world that is very much socially structured. Mm. So I can like or dislike things because they are available to me. If I were born in another place, maybe that thing wouldn't have been available. When mm. I was growing up, I couldn't say I like or I dislike tofu. Mm. Tofu was just not part of what we ate in Italy. I was born and raised in, in Rome and, you know, back in the day, I'm quite, you know, old, we didn't have that. So, 
there are your choices, your preferences, your personal histories, but it happens within uh, a culture, uh, a culinary culture that is determined by history, by geography, by politics, by uh, economics. For instance, there are elements of tradition. So as an Italian, for instance, pasta and pizza are very important parts of my upbring upbringing. Mm. Uh, when I lived in China, I realized, for instance, uh, other dishes were very important to define who people were, how they ate. Um, there is always also an element of performance. You do this because you do it as an individual, mm. but you're always doing it also because you're part of a community. Mm. And so, by, for instance, uh, proclaiming your preference or love for pasta and pizza, you do underline the fact that you belong to an Italian community. And this, um, the, the food element comes up in different aspects of our identity. For instance, religion, right? Mm. As a uh, Catholic, I basically can eat everything, but the church still tells me, well, before Easter, if you can do some fasting, mm. but for instance, Jews and Muslims can or cannot eat certain things. Uh, Brahmin Hindus tend to be vegetarian, if not somehow uh, vegan. So you have religion. Uh, you have age. You know, we eat different things at different ages. So That's right. also what we eat somehow defines us in that specific phase of our life. Uh, um, class. Who can afford caviar and foie gras? And who can afford just a bowl of rice mm. every day? So also class really defines us. Gender, it's very important. Here in the U.S., for instance, there is this cultural idea that meat, especially, you know, big steaks are for men. Mm. And it's not proper for women to eat that much meat. And, you know, maybe a salad, something daintier is better for uh, women. Not only that, in terms of genders, usually women are those in charge of buying food, cooking food. Men very often are the consumers. Of course, things are changing. But my point is, there are so many dimensions of our identity in which food uh, plays an important role. Mm. Both determines and reflects mm. our identity. Mm. Professor, it's so interesting, again, going back to the book, that I know you're quite a scholar, and also you traveled and um, lived throughout different countries and different parts of the world, for example, like you mentioned before, that you were born and raised in Italy, but also uh, throughout the bio, you traveled to Nepal and also Beijing, you know, across the continent. Now, Professor, my next question, I want to go back to the word food design. I think this is something that too often, or even at least nowadays, that we don't put the word food and design together. Because when we think about the word design, I mean, I might be shallow on this, but typically we think about architectural design and we think about uh, internal uh, design uh, uh, within this any houses or buildings or at least uh, uh, related to any type of fashion design. But when you, when you mention in the book, particularly you mention about food design, put, and especially I want to ask you that how, how should we understand the word, uh, the phrase food design today, especially that your study and your experiences really extends from Asia to the US mm -hmm. to Europe? Does, I mean, does anything have in common or do those countries have any similarities when we think about food design today? Help us understand. Okay, so let's start from the food design part first. Of course, traditionally, we thought of design as, you know, limited to objects. So you had industrial design, mm. you had graphic design, you had architecture, spaces. So urbanism, 
But in the past 30, 40 years, design has been expanding quite a bit. Mm. So design has become partly a method, a way to understand the world, but also to intervene and make changes mm. in the world. So for instance, now uh, we talk a lot about design thinking. Mm. So it's a specific way of uh, identifying an aspect of reality and figuring out ways to intervene or to improve or to introduce innovation. So the design as a, as a discipline as an, and a practice, a professional practice, has expanded from just object and spaces to interactions. And that started big, for instance, when computers became important. Designers had to figure out ways in which machines and humans could communicate based, of course, on the mechanics determined by the engineers, mm. but they work on the interactions. Later on, design now has been working on experiences, on services, on systems. Mm. And it is this part, the non-material part of design that works very well with food. Food, in my opinion, always needs to be understood and explore systemically. Hmm. We cannot just see what's in our dish. How did that get there? Who put it there? Who produced it? Hmm. What sort of economics, politics is behind that? And I talk a lot about this in my book, Food, that I published 2019 with MIT hmm. in Boston. Um, so if that is the case, we can apply design thinking and other design tool to rethink this food system. Mm. Is there any ways to make the food system more environmentally sustainable, healthier, more just? Is there a way to think about labor and trade and all these things? So uh, that's why I think food design as a role. Of course, you know, since it's more an, a, of an approach, a way of thinking, it can be applied to very different contexts. Mm. So last time I was in China, in Shanghai, mm. I had a conversation with a university that I should not mention, but they were very interesting in introducing also food design in their design school. Because they were thinking, China is changing enormously. People Paul's way of eating, of ordering food, of thinking about food has completely changed and very often the structures are still connected with the past where, you know, somebody else decided for you what was available. Mm. But for the younger consumers, that doesn't really make sense. So what can design do there? And that's the case of China, but you know, in Italy, design can contribute other things and in the US other things. I think it's really a method, a way of thinking, looking at reality and trying to intervene mm. other than specific objects. Professor, I want to get to the next part, which is the third part of the session regarding politics. You know, again, back in the days when I was travel in China, you know, as we mentioned before, that you went to Shanghai, and of course that I was able to visit Shanghai uh, and other multiple cities in China as well. But one thing that I noticed that you, that's something that you might agree with me that in China, that food is not just about the way that you treat or you show hospitality to one another. It's actually that bring down the barrier. So, so for, for example, when I was uh, uh, visiting my friends in Shanghai, that he took me to this fancy restaurant. And, you know, normally we would think about back in the days, only the rich people or only the higher officials and they could afford such expensive bills. But meanwhile, that through his introduction, I noticed that food represents the hospitality from people and also food represent this cozy, this harmonious relationship that people are looking for built. But meanwhile, that, you know, if you have international politicians or you have local politicians join the table, initially, no one would like to talk about po politics first. It's all about food. And then once people are satisfied 
and that will the real conversation starts and of course that as Chinese people say uh, it depends on how much you can drink and that really means how much deal you're going to get so professor <laughs> I want to I want to ask you about your experience that do you uh, how, how do you think that food not only back in the days but today can actually break down this political differences especially re uh, uh, regarding the countries who are intensively deadlocked today or facing this political struggles how does that even work systematically professor yeah well, first of all, don't get me started with baijiu and toast <laughs> during official Chinese dinners because I've been through that. But that said, um, there is always a tension there because in these sorts of dinners, both you know, so you get out with friends mm. or you have foreign guests and you invite them. Yes, there is this important aspect of hospitality. So the table does unite. But at the same time, there are subtle sort of games going on. Mm. Where do you invite your friends? Who's going to pay? And do I want to show off my knowledge mm. of the food world? Do I want to show my refinement, my cosmopolitanism? So, yes, you're spending time with friends, but at the same time, you're performing your identity in very subtle ways. When it comes to official meals, it becomes huge. Because at that point, what is put on the table? How is cooked? Mm. Who cooks it? Are very important political messages. So even if, as you said at the beginning, you know, everybody is happy about the meal and they enjoy eating, but through those gestures, lots of negotiations happen. And I think that's one of the elements that, for instance, gastro diplomacy mm. really looks at. Because on the one hand, gastro diplomacy is there to, as you say, bring different peoples together. But at the same time, there is still the interest of one country to show its best, mm. to improve its trade, to improve its status around the world or to showcase its power so i think there is always a tension between these elements so as i said in one of my first books you know the table unites mm. and divides mm. in the sense that these tensions are still there and if they're not sort of controlled they can get ugly and in my book for instance i mentioned many cases in which this gets ugly. Also, one element that I want to point out is that being open to, I don't know, food from other cultures, ethnic foods, doesn't mean you're actually open to those communities and those people. Mm. We can see here and in Europe with immigration, but I've seen also in China with different kind of you know, uh, minority, Xiaofu mm. uh, What happens, yes, I enjoy their food. They're offering me a service which is convenient, which is cheap. It provides variety to what I eat. But do I really engage with their culture? Mm. And more importantly, am I really open to welcome them as part of my community? Mm. Or will this just be sort of an economic interaction? They produce cheap, convenient, I buy, but they need to stay where they are. Mm. And that is often the case here in the US. Lots of you know people who are really against Mexican immigrants mm. very happy to tacos and burritos. Mm. No problem for that. As long as the Mexican stays in the kitchen, he makes cheap food, and it's sort of in their place, fine. Mm. Do they really get in, in, in conversation with Mexico as a culture? Not really, because then, you know, the physical walls are being built. That's right. 
Well, Professor, I know you're very busy, and I got two more questions before letting you go. Now, my next question, again, based on my travel experiences, and of course, the across the continent, I realized that more and more people are really into eating healthier and more nutritional. And I think this is not only that it's on the rise among the countries in Asia, but also across the continent. You know, for example, a lot more pe are people around me back in the days that when I was traveling, Traveling in countries in Southeast Asia, they were thinking about, or they, uh, most of them, they were uh, uh, vegetarians because they were, uh, you know, they have this uh, different ideologies and different concepts and stuff. Now, ha Professor, help us to understand how did the concept of eating healthier getting more attracted uh, or getting more attracted or more traction these days and that's number one and number two i think despite of political differences or nationalities or anything but at the end of the day people are still thinking how can i eat well in order to live well so how should we interpret those commonalities today i think <clears throat> this attention to health is one of the results of the globalization of the food system, mm -hmm. where now lots of food is delocalized, is produced transnationally, mm -hmm. and it's convenient, it's cheap, but very often is calorie rich, but nutrient poor. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, especially the poorest people, tend to eat that sort of food because it's accessible and cheap. Mm. Um, so the reaction to that is like, okay, let's try to eat better. Let's try to eat well because, you know, this sort of food that, you know, fast food or snacks and whatnot is bad for us. Mm. So some people can actually... Um, somehow afford it here in the US, unfortunately, that sort of fast food, cheap food, is mm. more affordable and accessible mm. to the poor. So you see that uh, overweight children tends to be of lower classes. And, you know, fit and healthy children tend to be of upper classes, which mm. is terrible mm. in many ways. Mm. In other parts of the world in which this industrialized mass production of food that's still penetrated, it's easier even for the poor to eat healthier. Mm. Because, you know, that's, I'm sorry, my cat decided to show up uh, <laughs> internationally. Um, because they have the opportunity of having access, for instance, to cheap vegetables and mm. fruit. In certain countries, especially the most industrialized one, vegetables and, and fruits of good quality mm. have become sort of a status symbol. Mm. You know, you go here in New York, you go to the farmer's market to get the best mm. of what's in season, but the prices mm. are much higher than the fruit and vegetables that you find in the supermarket, which are produced industrially, you know, in big fields with machineries, very often the quality is not as good. They are selected, those varieties are, are selected to give the yields to last a long time in stores. It's not about quality and taste. Mm. Or, you know, you even have processed food that it's really cheap in, in many ways. Mm. So I think this desire to be think healthier is a global phenomenon. Mm. And depending on the con context, different parts of the population have or not have access to it. Mm. Professor, I want to wrap up our conversation and um, I don't want to keep your cat waiting for so long. I know, uh, I know the cat want to be entertained, <laughs> but anyway. Typically, whenever we invite an author and a scholar, especially after this amazing book, and I strongly recommend everyone to go check it out. Professor, for anyone, that it doesn't matter what language, what political background, what nationalities that we're speaking, for any readers, what 
do you what do you want them to understand when they finish reading your book? So in other words, what is the biggest to take away you expect our readers to appreciate that for the all the efforts and dedication that you put in this book? I would like my readers to understand that food is not something neutral, natural, something that is outside of, you know, politics and social issues. No, it is a very important part. Mm. And that plays at every level from our everyday life to international politics. The other message is that food, as I said, the table can unite and divide. Mm. It's our choice as individuals and communities to decide what we want to do with food. Mm. Are we going to use it to keep people away from us? Or are we using it to create communication, mm. to create uh, a better tomorrow? So mm. I think these are the points that I would like my readers to get um, from my book. Well, ladies and gentlemen, again, I'm speaking to Professor Fabio Parasecotti. And Professor Fabio is a professor of food studies in the Nutrition and Food Studies Department in New York City. And again, I strongly encourage everyone to check out his new book, and which is entitled Gastronativism, Food, Identity, and Politics. Professor, thank you so much for taking your time to be on the show. And again, congratulations on this new book. And I thoroughly enjoy the conversation. And we'd love to have you back on the show as we continue to follow and pay attention how food is changing the political atmosphere today and also unify the people across the continent. Thank you, Professor. Thank you so much for having me.